name is Robert Momus. I'm an engineer, a quantum physicist, a mathematician, and a Freemason. But I've never been able to learn the alphabet, and I can't spell. I also know that I'll never be able to learn how to spell, or how to order or navigate an alphabetical list. These peculiar skills are way beyond the capability of my strangely structured brain. But as I will explain, an early introduction to symbols rescued me from a potential lifetime of illiteracy. I didn't realise I was different from most people until after I had gained a first-class honours in electronic engineering and a PhD in quantum physics. Certainly I knew I couldn't spell, but I had simply avoided the issue by making sure I studied maths and science. I avoided English and art subjects completely. Nobody could read my handwriting, but as I typed what I needed, it wasn't an issue. It was only when my daughter was struggling to learn to read and was tested for dyslexia that I was tested too. I was interested to discover I was so dyslexic that if I wrote with my left hand I produced perfect mirror writing and I never realised. Whichever hand I used looked okay to me, but the researcher who tested me seemed surprised. I attended primary school before dyslexia was invented, so it was obvious to my teachers that I daydreamed too much didn't pay proper attention to my lessons and was a bit thick. For a while I was no different from the other children who had also just started school. The problems only arose when I failed to learn the alphabet, something I still haven't mastered. I found it easy to memorise my times tables and quickly mastered mental arithmetic. I just couldn't get a grip on the relationship between letters, words and the sounds of spoken language. To me every word has a unique shape, which varies according to its position in the piece of writing. Each word has ten different forms, depending on whether it is alone on the page, as on a flashcard, at the beginning, middle or end of a line, at the top, in the middle, or at the end of a paragraph. Each of these shapes is subtly different, and has to be learned as a distinctive symbol. Perhaps it's of interest to a non-dyslexic to learn that these symbols are not in any way related to the sounds of the words they represent. To learn a word, I have to memorise each of the ten symbols used to portray it, and then remember the sound the word makes. The fact I could learn to read it from a flashcard was no help at all when it appeared in a piece of text, as I then had to learn it again in each of its nine possible configurations, because it looks different in each. And if you change the font, that's another ten symbols I have to learn. I think my teachers assumed I wasn't really paying attention, as they seemed disappointed when I failed to recognise a word from a flashcard when it was put in a sentence. Uh, the fact it was a completely new configuration, as far as I was concerned, never seemed to occur to any of them. Incidentally, I still read that way. And if I see a new shape, I'm not sure if it is a word, or what noise it makes, until I have heard it read out. I have, however, got better at mapping words I am shown into the whole set of symbol variations which can occur with them. It was only when I started with piano lessons I began to develop a way of overcoming my failure to learn how to read. It was a stroke of good fortune for me that my father was a frustrated pianist and decided I must learn the piano. But I'll always be grateful to him as he made me get up early on Saturday mornings to sit for half an hour at the grand piano of Mr. David Rudofsky. I laboriously learned to translate the odd shapes of the musical notation into hand shapes on the keyboard, and eventually into beautiful musical phrases. I recognised that there was a mechanical linkage between the shapes on paper and the sounds that I could turn into the unique shapes of musical chords which I pressed on the keyboard. When I played notes on the keyboard in the sequence indicated by the symbols, then the music sang out from the piano. Magically, the score shapes turned into music. As I progressed to playing popular songs, I added the word shapes of the lyrics into that music. I would play the notes on the keyboard and sing the words along. As I was doing this, it dawned on me that both systems worked in the same way. So for the first time, I had a way of making sense of reading. As it turned out, reading words was much harder than reading music because music is always written along a stave, and each note is separately written on that stave. Reading books was more complex, because of the ten different word positions which had to be learned. It is actually 54,000 times harder for a dyslexic to learn how to read 
than it is for somebody who can understand the alphabet. Lyrics, though, were written between the stave like music notes, and this gave fewer word shapes to learn. In this way, I began to understand how reading worked. I started to pay more attention to the minute similarities between the same word in different positions, and to ignore the massive differences. I started to look at the top of each line of text as if it was a stave of music, and to ignore the confusing shapes which emerged when the word was set within a paragraph. Suddenly I found I could read. At first I would use a ruler to block out the line above, so that every line was a top line, with only three word shapes to learn for each word. Using this technique, I could learn, memorise and verbalise words, once somebody told me the sound they made. But as I didn't know how to guess from their shape what that sound might be, I got better at devising tricks to get people to speak out loud any new words I came across. I soon discovered that any teacher would say the word I was pointing at and then tell me its meaning if I said, I'm not quite sure what that means. It worked well enough for me to build up a basic vocabulary. Sometimes, though, the trick earned me an old-fashioned look. Once I'd made the connection between the music page and piano keyboard, it was a simple step to move from a piano keyboard to a typewriter keyboard. At the age of twelve, I saved up my pocket money and bought a second-hand portable typewriter. My cousin had been to typing school, and she showed me where to put my hands on the keyboard and which keys to use with each finger. She gave me lots of exercises to play on the QWERTY keyboard, and I compared the shapes which appeared on the paper with shapes I was copy-typing, until I could reproduce the text. Even today, if you ask me how to spell a word, I have no idea, but I know the shape it makes on a keyboard, and can play the equivalent of a musical phrase on the typing keyboard to make the word shapes I need to write. I can also spell, if I look down at my fingers and see the letters marked on the keys, I'm pressing to make the word shape. In this way, I learned how to write, and how to fake the ability to spell. I didn't read as other people do, though, and I still don't. I'm quite unable to make sense of the alphabet, and I can't use a printed dictionary. Perhaps I can explain just how different this makes the world seem by giving an example. When I'm searching a telephone directory, I do it by flipping through it from the back to the front, while simultaneously hoping for a name similar to the one I want to find, to skip across my line of vision. To me, the alphabetic sequence is an arbitrary and illogical whim that I am congenitally incapable of remembering. Spelling remains a mystery to me, particularly when I handwrite, as I can fill in the important parts in the centre of words with almost any letters. Only the shapes matter to me. For that ability to see shapes turned me towards the study of science. The shapes that numbers and letters make when they are used in equations have always been simpler to understand than the odd, arbitrary combinations used for spelling words. I find the symbols of mathematics beautiful and understandable, and word shapes slippery and ambiguous. Unlike most of my contemporaries, therefore, I had no difficulty with algebra. I loved the way equations could be shaped and manipulated, to yield up answers to interesting questions. It was a way to reveal things I didn't know I knew. I quickly learned that mathematics held the key to understanding how the world worked. The symbols and shapes were a natural language which my dyslexic mind took to as a pig takes to a fresh mud wallow. The secondary school I went to did not have a sixth form, and no pupils had ever taken a general certificate of education, GCE or level exams. When I reached the fifth year, I was entered for ten ULCI, Union of Lancashire and Cheshire Institutes, exams, which were a lower level than the O-level. By then I had developed handling techniques to overcome my oddities with reading and writing. Because I only looked at the upper envelope of the tight word, which defined its shape, I had accidentally discovered how to speed read, and was devouring large numbers of books. I didn't have to decode the letters which make up the word, as I could not even see them. To me, words look like a musical score that encodes speech, rather than musical notes, with the paragraphs acting as the stave does for musical notation, and they can be quickly scanned for meaning, rather like sight-reading a musical score. The intense effort I had put into memorising the shapes of all the basic words in all the contexts where I might meet them had developed my memory, and I had little trouble in recalling the contents of these books, 
even if I did appear to be scanning rather than absorbing each page carefully as I read it. In those days, when much examination content consisted of reproducing facts, this was a highly practical skill. I had partially solved the problem of writing by learning to touch type, but all my teachers complained my handwriting was illegible. My school taught copperplate handwriting. It was, in effect, a continuous loopy line with little shape to it. I found it extremely hard to read, as all the distinctive shapes I could see in typeset words were smoothed into loopy nothingness when handwritten. By learning to type, I now knew which letter keys to hit and in which order to hit them so as to write the words I used regularly. But I needed some way of turning unique word shapes into handwriting. Copperplate, though, was not the sort of script I could either read or write with any precision. Then, by yet another stroke of good fortune, I received a letter from a close friend of the family. It was handwritten, but with each letter contributing a clear-cut and distinct outline to the word shapes. When I asked about this writing style, I was told it was called italic. Now I had a way forward. The italic letters were not connected by meaningless loops and swirls, but stood out as individual shapes, just as the letters on a typewriter did. Once I had learned to draw the shape of the individual italic letter, I could look in my visual memory and see where it was on the keyboard, and then draw it. Italic script enabled me to handwrite as if I was typing. It slowed my writing down, and I made far more mistakes than I did with a typewriter, but this method had the benefit that other people could read it. It worked because each of the individual italic letters could be drawn quite separately, unlike copperplate script, which had to be created in a single flowing scribble. This way of writing roughly coincided with the method of touch typing I had adopted in order to write down words, and it is a technique I still use today when I need to handwrite something. I was pleased when most of my teachers commented how much easier it was to read my writing, and in my naive way I was quietly proud of solving the problem. But I then met an example of mindless prejudice, which still makes me angry over sixty years later. I was about six months into my experiment in italic hand typing when I moved class. That meant a new teacher. At the time I thought her old, although looking back she must have been only middle-aged. However, she was so firmly set in her ways, she was unable to accept any sort of individuality in her pupils. She took a dislike to my italic writing and set out to force me to revert to the unusable copperplate that the rest of the class and the school favoured. In front of the class she berated my written work. She poked fun at the highly angular shapes of my writing, calling it uncultured and barbarian. When I told her it was a far better way to write because I could read it myself and so could she, she really lost her rag and sent me to the headmaster to be caned for insolence. After declining a chance to apologise, I duly received two strokes on each hand, but refused to change my way of writing. Instead, I appealed over her head to my new English teacher, a Mr Noel Drury, to whom I explained why I had decided to change my writing style. I told him I was tired of being told how bad my handwriting and spelling was. I wrote him an essay about the importance of clear handwriting, and he spoke to the woman, and her attack ceased. But her hostility simmered on, and instead of being attacked, I was ignored. I, however, was beginning to develop the independent mind of a scientist, and learning to back my own instincts about reading and writing. I scored top grades in all ten ULCI exams to both my own and my teacher's great surprise. Having failed the 11-plus and being consistently taken to task for erratic spelling, I decided I wanted to do something practical. I was interested in the new discipline of electronics, so I applied to the general post office to become an apprentice telephone engineer. The GPO offered me a place to start in September, but when the school learned of my success in the ULCI, they asked if I and four other students would like to stay on an extra year and take O-level GCEs. For the first time in my life I saw the possibility of going to college, studying science and becoming a technician in a lab, rather than a wireman who climbed telegraph poles. 
I did just as well at O-level as I had the previous year, and so became a minor celebrity at school. I got the best grades in their history. College became a possibility, not a remote dream. I wanted to study science, and I was sure the only way to understand it was to learn mathematics. I loved the patterns numbers created and found the manipulation of equations sheer delight. My struggle to learn to read had developed my ability to see patterns and proved a useful skill for an aspiring scientist. I signed up at Salford Technical College to take three A-level GCEs in Applied Mathematics, Pure Mathematics and Physics. I spent the next two years wallowing in Newton's laws, the mystery of the calculus and the basics of optic and atomic theory. My time at Salford Technical College provided me with a solid grounding in mathematics and physics. With three GCE A-levels, applied mathematics, pure mathematics and physics, I wanted to go to university. I'd gone to tech hoping to get a few A-levels and perhaps be able to apply for a technician apprenticeship in electronics somewhere in Manchester. But at the tech I mixed with a different type of student than I had at my school. No one at school considered going to university. It wasn't something secondary modern boys did. They left school at 15 and went to be labourers, to work in shops and warehouses, or if they were highly ambitious, applied to be apprentice fitters for the gas board. My difficulties with English and spelling had pushed me towards studying maths, where my dyslexic grasp of symbols and patterns proved a positive advantage. But it also opened a new world to me. I had finally developed enough skill at italic letter shaping and intensive word shape recognition to disguise my lack of skill in spelling. So I was no longer the oddity who was a careless speller and couldn't use a dictionary. Didn't need a large vocabulary of hard-to-spell words for mathematics. I used a small and specialised range of words, which I was able to reproduce quickly and accurately, and a large array of symbols that I loved manipulating. In physics, I was not only allowed to draw pictures, instead of explaining in words, I was encouraged to do so. I soon found out I could master optics by drawing light rays and lenses on squared graph paper. For the problems of applied mathematics, I sketched out vector diagrams of the forces, so I could see the geometry of the situation, and use the elegant conventions of trigonometry to calculate the resultant forces. I got good A-levels and now had a chance of going to university. But which one? I liked Owens, Manchester Victoria University. It was the place where computing had been invented. I liked Umis, because it had a really good physics department. And I liked Salford, because it had set up the first degree in electronics anywhere in the country. It would be nice to say I had a choice of all three. But I didn't. Both Owens and Umis rejected my application on the grounds I had not studied either French or German at O-level. All was not lost, though. The Ferroconcrete Royal College of Advanced Technology was prepared to consider me. I knew they were to become a full degree awarding a university in two years' time, and if I could get on to their electronics degree, I would graduate from what would then be Salford University. I applied to the Royal College of Advanced Technology. They looked at my grades in maths and physics and invited me for interview. They didn't seem to be worried whether I had a good French accent. They were more interested in how good I was at sums and if I was interested in electronics. They offered me a place and in due course I joined the Salford Royal College of Advanced Technology on the opposite side of the Peel Park campus from the Tech Building. I got a BSc in electronics with first class honours and then, after six months working for Ferranti Electronics, went back to Salford to do a PhD in solid-state physics. After my PhD, I went back to Ferranti for a few years, before deciding I really wanted to move to a university and teach. To make this possible, I decided to take a local night school class to qualify as an FE teacher. It was during this course that I discovered I was dyslexic. Up to that point, I'd assumed that everybody else had the same problems with spelling and the alphabet that I did, and I was just a bit slow in learning how to solve these problems of reading and writing. By the time I became a lecturer at the University of Bradford, I had sorted out how to hide the fact I was dyslexic by never handwriting anything. It's only since I've become established as a best-selling writer 
that I have admitted in public that I am dyslexic. I want to tell you more about the nature of dyslexia and how it affects the people who are blessed with it. Dyslexia enriches my life to an enormous extent, and I've never seen it as a problem. The odd brain configuration which makes me dyslexic gives me so many benefits, such as the ability to see shapes and patterns in events, physical situations and mathematical functions, the ability to speed read text, even upside down or in a mirror. I don't have to bother looking at individual letters or even individual words, but I can scan text to replay the voice of the words into my mind, and also gives me an edactic memory, which I can use to replay things I have observed within my mind and look for details I didn't intentionally perceive on a first looking. All these advantages which my dyslexically configured brain gives me, means I wouldn't want to change anything about the way I think, read, or write. I wouldn't want to give up any of the enhanced visual and pattern perception abilities for various types of symbol that this condition gives, just to be able to turn off my computer's spell checker. Any old mechanical device can spell and sort things into alphabetical order. It takes a human mind to think the unlikely, to share its ideas and to tell stories that people want to read or listen to and to engage fully with the exposure to different symbols which Freemasonry offers. But that doesn't mean that being dyslexic is recognised as normal. Let me give you a small insight into what it's like to be dyslexic and share part of my worldview with you. It will take me far longer to describe these incidents than it did for me to experience them. But let me describe a typical sequence of worrying, which I have come to understand is a regular state of mind that characterises my dyslexia. I'm in a comfortable bed in a dark, still room, but I twist and turn under the bedclothes. My body is restless because a remorseless churning of images dominates my mind. I silently remind myself that I need to sleep. I must get up early in the morning. I try to still my thoughts and rest. I've got to be in college by 8.30 at the latest. I roll over and see the red glowing figures of the clock on the bedside radio. It says 2.45. And I instinctively calculate how long I could sleep if I am to be up at 6.45. The numbers slip and slide across the screen of my mind as they rearrange themselves to answer my unspoken question. The number 4 swirls out of the melee, confirming... I will only get four hours sleep at best. But what if I don't go to sleep quickly? I see myself drowsy, fuzzled and sleepy, with the radio alarm showing 6.45. I'm struggling to get my thoughts in order for the coming day, and waking up is so hard to do. I visualise a blank slate to project my mental images onto. If I can create an uncluttered area where the images of new thoughts appear, I can erase them. I try to wipe that imaginary slate clean, as fast as it fills up. But the first image that appears is of me setting off to work, and leaving behind the notes for the lecture I am intending to give. I see myself driving down the road, and my mind's eye flashes back to the hall table, and zooms in on my forgotten notes. I pan back to my disappearing car, see myself shaking my head to clear the sleepiness from my mind, heedless of the missing notes, rushing on as I worry about the time and the state of the traffic. I picture each of the things I will need tomorrow. I make a mental list and check my memory to reveal where I left each item in turn. My blank slate now shows images of piles of notes, a mobile phone, a textbook, and my office keys, each sitting in the location I last saw them. My phone is on the table at the foot of the stairs, plugged into its charger. The textbook on the third shelf down in my library, about two foot along and standing out with its yellow spine. So it goes on, and I scan up, down and across this increasingly complex list, viewing and reviewing detail. My office keys are on the desk in my study, and as I check them, I notice my computer and see an email which I have marked as unread. I did that to remind me to respond to it and a reply needs to be sent before I set off for the morning's lecturing. My future vision returns to a sleepy me, driving down the road, worrying about the traffic and time, 
Then the diabolical pessimism of my mind scans back to my study to show the email still marked unread. I can feel it gloating that it's caught me out. The images of the blank slate get more layered and confusing. More options and outcomes appear. The certainty of what I need to do when I wake up is lost in a confusion of possibilities. I can feel the panic building up. Should I get up and send the email now, in case I forget? I force myself to wipe the slate clean, and again try to lose myself in sleep. I return to visualising the clean, blank slate. I tell myself that no worrying thought can survive my wiping away as it tries to form. Sometimes I keep the slate clear, then I sleep. Sometimes something crucial appears on it, and it kicks off a fresh worry cycle. This is a regular thing for me. I'm a champion worrier. My talent for finding trivial things to worry about is awesome. For as long as I can recall, I've worried about something. Today, even though I have less to worry about, doesn't inhibit me. Once upon a time, I used to worry about learning how to read. Reading, or rather lack of reading, worried me from the age five, when I found I couldn't do it, until the age of ten, when I developed a way to read. It was a long time before I realised I wasn't like other people. I had found a different way. With reading solved, I focused my worrying on learning to write, and that too required a series of different solutions to my writing problem, as I explained in part one. Worrying and visualisation is an essential part of my dyslexic mindset. To some people, being dyslexic means I have a learning impairment. To others, it means I'm disabled. To many of the adults I met as a child, it meant I was thick, stupid, and daydreamed too much. To me, being dyslexic means that I live in a world made rich and frightening by an acute visual imagination and a photographic memory. But as I didn't find out I was dyslexic until I was in my thirties, I didn't know this was unusual. I thought everybody's mind worked just like mine. I worry because my ability to quickly see all the possible ways something might go wrong gives me lots of reasons to do so. I see outcomes that non-dyslexic thinkers, who must go the process of verbalising every thought, just don't have time to appreciate. However, thinking quickly, using fast-flowing pictures without words, has its drawbacks, as well as its advantages. My worrying is always decidedly focused. It was forced into sharp relief by the distressing topic of not being able to read. Now, unless you too are dyslexic, then learning to read was no big deal. If you are dyslexic, then you too know it's an ongoing torment. Reading and its complementary apocalyptic horsemen of spelling and handwriting have hounded me all my life. But with the benefit of a scientist's hindsight, I can now explain exactly why that is. I now understand the problem, solutions and insight which my brain experienced as I came to terms with it. I know how I learned to manage, and finally to enjoy and exploit the weird thought processes enabled by my dyslexic brain. I am either blessed or cursed with a photographic memory, and it goes right back to my childhood. It's like having a large store of video recordings in my head, which I can access whenever I want, and when I do, they replay as if I was there. In my early days, I didn't know that I couldn't read, and so it didn't bother me. So I found other things to worry about. My earliest memory of worrying was when I started trying to picture what was happening outside my field of vision. Let me take you back to a very early memory. I'm in the bedroom of the house where I was born, and I'm worrying about not being able to go to sleep. I'm lying in a small bed, possibly a cot with its side lowered. I'm not sure, as I can't see it clearly, and I can't move to touch it. The room is dark, but I can just make out a large bed. I know this is the bed where my parents sleep, but I can only see a dimly outlined shape away to the left. I can't quite hear the reassuringly steady breathing of both my sleeping parents, so I need the comfort of the light that shines around the partly open door. I'm lying on my side, facing the door, and through the gap I can see the light from a single electric bulb at the top of a flight of stairs. There's a dark shape lying on my parents' bed. I know it's important that I go to sleep, but I can't, and from where I'm lying I also see the door of a large cupboard at the top of the stairs. It's not quite closed, and it's full 
a very black darkness. I know there's something else in that cupboard, hiding just inside the darkness, where I can't see it. That's why the landing light is on. Whatever it is won't come out while the light's on. I want the light to stay on, so it can't escape. I doze slightly, and through my half-closed eyelids I sense a faint, dim flickering. I hear a creaking and shuffling. At first this doesn't register with my trying-to-sleep mind. Then the landing light goes off, and I'm alone in the deep, dumb depths of the dreadful dark. With the light out, there's nothing to keep it in the cupboard, and it's going to get me. Don't ask me what it is, because I didn't know then, and I don't know now. But it terrified me then, and reliving the memory now still makes me want to glance over my shoulder into the darker corners of this room, just in case it might be lurking there. I wish I could stop my hair standing on end, but the memory is still powerful enough to overrule the nerves of my scalp. I know instinctively what darkness visible means. But enough of the present. Let's go back to this early memory. The child me of my past howls a wordless whimper as I begin to imagine it coming for me. I build it up into a sobbing shriek of incoherent fear. Then the bedroom light comes on, and my father looms over me. He speaks to me in a reassuring way. I can sense the tone of his voice, but I can't understand his words. This memory predates my learning to talk. My fear of what is in the darkness is real, as are the images of the room. When I review the scene today, I can see that my father must have been lying on the bed, waiting for me to go to sleep, before turning out the landing light. I have no earlier memory than that one, which must have been when I was between one and two years old. The fear of the dark was created by my dyslexic brain, as it learned to visualise and fill in any blanks in my world with imaginary images. I couldn't see inside the cupboard, so I invented something to fill that gap in my world. And when the darkness stopped me seeing what was really there, my fear walked out of the landing cupboard and stalked towards me, invisible in the darkness. In some ways, the unique tangle of neurons which created this visualisation in my brain is typical of any human brain, but in some important ways it's different. Professor Vilayamal Ramachandra, director of the Centre for Brain and Cognitive Research at the University of California, sums up my differences in his comments about the disparities between the right and left hemispheres of the brain and their individual approaches to life. The right hemisphere tends to be more emotionally volatile than the left. Patients who have a stroke in the left brain are often anxious, depressed and worried about their prospects for recovery. The reason seems to be that with their left brain injured, their right brain takes over and frets about everything. In contrast, people who suffer damage to the right hemisphere tend to be blissfully indifferent to their own predicament. The left hemisphere just doesn't get all that upset. But let's return to the question of what would my two minds think if I was really split in two, and kept alive by devilishly clever science and a blood-proof plastic coating. My right-hand side would worry about not being able to balance. It would worry if the plastic coating was really going to be liquid-tight, enough to keep enough blood in me for me to survive. It might ponder if I would be able to buy individual shoes at a discount. Perhaps I might be forced to buy a complete pair, and then have to negotiate the sale of the other one to my left hemisphere. My other half, however, wouldn't be the least concerned if it went barefoot, and it would have all the money because I normally keep my wallet in my left-hand trouser pocket. This disparity in the way the two hemispheres of all brains think raises a crucial concern for dyslexics. Research by neurobiologists at Yale University located the parts of the brain that carry out the specific functions of language processing. Dr. Sally Shavitz studied dyslexics and non-dyslexics, and she found a significant dyslexic tendency to make you more use of the right-hand side of the brain. When I read her report, I was extremely excited. For years, I had been convinced that my dyslexic brain was wired up differently from the brains of most of the people I work with at my university. 
Reading books such as Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain by Professor Betty Edwards convinced me that I made more use of my right brain than many people do. Now, with scientific evidence to support this hypothesis, it provided me with something new and interesting to worry about. As a university lecturer, I've worked with many dyslexic students. One of the characteristics I share with them is this powerful tendency to worry. Perhaps this is because we all make greater use of the right hemisphere of our brains and so expose ourselves to a thinking mode that promotes worrying. A high proportion of the successful dyslexics I meet professionally, and by successful I mean those who have achieved a level of management of their dyslexia so they've been able to be accepted into a university, have what is called a photographic memory. It's something I take for granted, as it was only by memorising a vast array of symbol shapes I learned how to read. It's called eidetic memory. Its name comes from the Greek word for image, and psychologists call it by this name, because people with this type of memory think mainly in pictures. Professor Stephen Rose, a neurobiologist at the Open University, has studied eidetic memory. He said, What in young children is an apparently general capacity becomes a remarkable rarity in adults. This change in the quality of memory also helps account for the very different ways we remember our childhood experiences and our adulthood. A 30-year-old man does not remember his 10-year-old self in the same way as a 50-year-old remembers his 30-year-old self. Sometime before puberty, there is for most of us a transition in how we perceive and remember the world, a transition which means that our adult memories are strangely disarticulated from our childhood ones. My memories aren't disarticulated. They are continuous from the age of five onwards. This is a problem because my eidetic memory records everything as equally important. Professor Rowe speculates that the way we remember changes because we learn to use a perceptual filter to remove extraneous detail from our observations. I never learnt that trick. I remember everything. He explains. The transition from childhood to adult memory is dramatic, from imaged and timeless to linear and time-bound. In most adults, memories seem to be formed in an orderly sequence and undergo a series of transformations from the time when they are first acquired to their later, more permanent form. Yet a few individuals retain in adulthood the eidetic memory of their childhood, a sort of arrested development, like the tadpole that won't metamorphosize into a frog. We marvel at their abilities, but usually fail to see at what cost such talents are bought. One of the costs suffered by users of eidetic memory is a tendency to become dyslexic. A very high proportion of the dyslexics retain this photographic type of memory into their adult lives. Perhaps dyslexics really are inadvertent tadpoles who have become addicted to a high-speed visual way of thinking which most adult frogs cast aside in favour of the slower, more discriminating methods of verbal processing. To carry Dr. Rose's metaphor a little further, think about a group of tadpole siblings all living together in a pond. They can all breathe water through their gills, they can all swim about, play hide-and-seek in the pondweed, and enjoy midnight feasts on the jelly remnants of their parents' spawn. But this equality does not last. Most of the tadpoles grow legs, lose their gills, turn green, and find they can climb out of the water and hop around in the world of reading. But what if a little tadpole never grows up? What happens to such a froggy Peter Pan? He has to stay in the illiterate water. His brothers, sisters and playmates all grow legs, turn green, and climb up into the choking upper surface of his world. If he ever sees them again, it's as juvenile voyeurs, sniggering from the bank, while he hides in the pondweed, watching the green grown-ups having sex and making spawn. Then as the new tadpoles hatch, just for a while he's king of the pack, the biggest tadpole in the pond, until his newly found playmates grow legs, turn green, and once more hop out of his lonely, silent world of images. Is it any wonder that he worries? Is this bleak picture a fairy story, 
or a real description of what happens in all dyslexic brains. I can't generalise as I only know my own experience, but I do know that the fact I see every individual word as a distinct and separate pictogram has given me a lifelong interest in symbols and how they interact with thinking. It drew me to the study of mathematics, music and masonic symbols. Reading text was an accidental achievement which developed out of learning to read music and understanding that if I could look at a music score and press keys on the piano, I could change printed shapes into tunes. I extended this skill to typing groups of letters onto a typing keyboard to make word pictograms that I could recognise. I can fake being able to spell, but all I really know is the pattern I need to play out on a keyboard to make a word shape. And if I say it out loud or even sub-vocalise the sound of that word shape, I can listen to the saying of the words. I will never learn the alphabet or how to spell, but I know how to vocalise symbols into words, emotions or quantities, and since I learned to touch type, I've been able to fool people into thinking I can spell and write. Although I can't use a dictionary because I can't find a particular word shape in it without reading it from end to end. I can read a tracing board or a set of equations more clearly than a printed page. Many symbols offer me wonderful insights and spawn ideas in unrelated subjects. Masonry, with its system of training in the appreciation of symbols, has helped me understand both myself and the world I live in. Maybe I can't spell, but I wouldn't swap my dyslexic ability to swiftly identify patterns for all the spelling bees in existence. My name is Robert Lomas. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then please click the subscribe box in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then please click the subscribe box in the bottom right hand corner of the screen.